but so I've talked to people who are very successful in what they do. I've talked to people who have like millions of followers and whatnot, and consistently, it doesn't matter if they're successful or not, if they're 50 years old or 15 years old. The one thing that I've taken away is no one really knows what they're doing with their lives. Everyone's just doing the best they can with the resources that they have. Welcome back to Other People's Lives. I'm Joe Santagato. I'm Greg Dybeck. For anyone out there that wants to be a guest on our show, don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach us uh, on our website, oplshow.com, or send us an email directly at oplpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, and quick promo code for OPL listeners. If you guys don't know, Joe and I just came out with a trivia party game. It's called Pay the Price. Here it is, looking all nice. Uh, but you don't have to be good at trivia because if you get your question wrong, then you pull a consequence card, which are like hilarious challenges and embarrassing things to do in front of your friends. So definitely check that out at paythepricegame.com and use the promo code OPL for 15% off. Now, today we're going to be speaking with a man who is on a mission that very much aligns with, I would say, the ethos and kind of overall essence of OPL and why we do the show. So his name is Rob Lawless, uh, which I'm just going to put this out there, definitely sounds like a porn star name. Uh, <laughs> but Rob is not a porn star. He is the creator of Rob's 10K Friends, which is his personal mission to spend one hour with 10,000 different people. And this is a mission that we can definitely get behind, and we're excited to learn more about the idea behind it, the logistics, and some of the people that he's met along the way. So we've got Rob on the line, and first of all, thank you for taking the time today to chat with us. Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you for having me. I've gotten a lot of compliments on my name before, but no one else has ever described me as a porn star name, so I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, it just it seemed the most obvious to me. It, it, it had to be said. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I want to know really about, I guess, the first moment that this idea popped into your head. And like I said in the beginning, similar concept in a sense to what Joe and I are doing here. And I remember what it was like for us, you know, coming up with the concept of the show and then how much the brain just starts working to put together the pieces and figure out, you know, is this even possible? Can I pull this off? So for you, what was that initial moment and initial idea? And, you know, what, why do you think you had it? Right. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like I'm still trying to figure out if I can pull this off. But <laughs> I, so I'm from the suburbs of Philadelphia. I went to Penn State University and graduated in 2013. So when I was a student there, I was really involved in clubs and activities. Uh, both my older siblings went there. So by the time I got there, I kind of had an idea of what to get involved with. There's a big fundraiser at Penn State, which you may or may not have heard of. It's the Penn State Dance Marathon. And it's a fundraiser for the fight against pediatric cancer. So that was kind of my first home of people. I joined a committee for that organization. Then I joined a fraternity. I became a tour guide. I would do Habitat for Humanity trips over spring breaks. And I was part of our homecoming efforts. So that campus, even though it was 40,000 people, it very quickly became a home where I was running into people that I knew like every time I walked outside to go to class or if I was at the bars, I'd always see someone other than the group that I went with. So I really enjoyed that type of experience, that sense of community. And I studied finance, minored in accounting and entrepreneurship. And when I graduated, I started doing consulting for Deloitte. So I went into this very like buttoned up corporate role. And, and I realized that all that happiness that I had had at Penn State, I wasn't experiencing anymore. I was kind of in this situation where I was looking at a computer screen for 12 hours a day and um, having minored in entrepreneurship, I was always convinced that I could create my own path in life. So I was like, what can I do? And lacking that sense of community, I wanted to get back to it. And I wanted to m be able to meet people without an agenda. So I was like, I'm going to try to meet 10,000 people and I'm just going to do it because I'm curious to see what comes of it. And thought about it the first time, January of 2014 and met the very first person November of 2015. So I, I'm, this is like super interesting. Like I love the, the whole concept of it. Are, are these people all just like complete strangers or like do they have to be complete strangers or can it be just like one degree of separation, like someone you just haven't met yet but know is one of your friends or something? My intention was to have everyone be complete, strange, like new to me because for me, it was, it was a way to meet new people, uh, more so than a way to share people's stories, which I also do. But 
yeah, I, I just wanted to get out and, and meet people at the time I was living in Philly. Um, so there have been people like I met a girl who was two grades above me in my high school and I knew of her at school, but she and I had never really taken the time to sit down with each other for an hour. And I spend one hour one on one with each person that I meet. So yeah, like a, a friend of my sister's I met, but the vast majority, like 99% of the people that I've met, I never met before in my life or had any interaction with. Wow. And why 10,000? Is that kind of in line with the whole 10,000 hours theory? Like that, that's what it takes to master something? It was not, it wasn't really inspired by that, though I draw a lot of inspiration from that now. Something I'm more compared to is, so Seth Godin wrote this book called A Purple Cow or The Purple Cow. And I'd never read the book, but the concept is if you're driving down the street and you pass a cow on a farm, you're not going to think twice. But if you're driving down the street and you pass a purple cow, you're going to stop your car, you're going to get out your phone and take a picture of it and be like, what is going on with this cow? So the idea of meeting one new person is not anything revolutionary, right? It's just something that a lot of people do with networking or whatever. And as someone who wanted to turn this kind of into a career, the mark of 10,000 I think is what for me made it interesting enough that people would want to be part of it, that it would turn people's heads and that it, it gave me time to turn it into a career rather than a new year's resolution or a side project. Hmm. Right. And, and is that how you approach people and how do you like do the outreach and find these random people? Like, and, and how do you sort of approach them, you hmm. know, to convince them like, Hey, spend an hour with me in the beginning. So I left Deloitte after a year and three months and I went to a tech startup in Philadelphia and I was on their sales team. So every day I was emailing random people for work, asking them to hop on a call for 30 minutes. So the idea of reaching out to a stranger for their time was not weird to me. And I kind of built up that thick skin of not caring if I got rejected or not. So in the beginning, there's a website called billypen.com in Philadelphia. And they have a who's next list, like who's next in the culinary scene or who's next in the art scene or the political scene. And I thought, I'll just find the people's emails from those lists and I'll email them. and asked them to be part of it. And that's what I did. I just emailed random people from Philly uh, and was like, hey, I have this idea to meet 10,000 people. Do you want to be one of the first 10? Here's a bit about me. And for some reason, people were up for the idea. They mm -hmm. decided to be part of it. I've reconnected with some of them since who they, they thought I was running a, a multi-level marketing scheme. But <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, they took the time to meet with me. And um, then word just kind of spread. I would meet people and they'd say, you know, who you should talk to is this person or this person would be really great for your project. And with social media, too, like this was back before Instagram stories even existed. People would repost my photos to their Instagram account hmm. and be like, hey, I met this guy, Rob. He has a goal to meet 10,000 people. And then eventually I started to get press and then I had some bigger accounts repost it or share it to their stories. So it just grew. And now it's at the point where pretty much after I met the first 65 people, people started reaching out to me. And I would go through ebbs and flows where I'd have to reach back out to people or I'd be overwhelmed at times. And last year, right around this time, I put out a TikTok video just saying, hey, I'm doing this project to meet 10,000 people. If you want to be one of them, hit me up on Instagram. And I had about 1,000 people message me. And I put out another very similar video back in January and had about another thousand people message me. So now it's at the point where people just see my account, they see that their friends are part of it, and it's kind of self-sustaining of people reaching out to me. Yeah, totally. Gotcha. It sounds very familiar to, you know, kind of our story with this show too. There was so much outreach that needed to be done at first just to convince people of this concept because it is still strange no matter what for a lot of people to understand why does someone want to talk to me with no agenda, like you said earlier? Or I guess the agenda is documenting and creating a platform, but it's nothing beyond that. It's just to basically show, you know, don't judge people by their cover or everyone kind of has a story. Uh, but then once it kind of snowballs and people start reaching out and it becomes, becomes self-sustaining, uh, that that's a really cool moment because then you kind of know you're onto something, right? Because it shows that other people believe in this project as well and want to be a part of it. So that's really awesome to hear. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like if you build it, they will come type thing, right? Totally. Yeah. Um, I'm curious also, like, you know, what kind of conversations are you having? I mean, you're meeting like all these people. 
um, when you're sitting down with them, is it like awkward to begin or do you usually have some of the same conversations? Do you ask the same questions? Like what kind of conversations are you having? I think my goal is to, so I, I take a picture with everyone that I meet. I used to do everything in person. I met 3,259 people in person and then COVID happened. So I took everything virtual, which has actually been a blessing in disguise, but uh, now I meet everyone virtually and I forget why I'm even bringing this up, but yeah, it's not, it's not awkward. Oh, I try So I create a post of everyone afterwards. I would take a picture with them and write from memory what, what I learned from that person. And I would kind mm -hmm. of structure it in their life story. Like, here's where they're from. Here's where they went to school, whatever. Here's what they do now. Here's where they want to go in the future. So when I talk to people, that's what I'm curious about is their life path, because I want to know authentically as much about this person's story as I can uh, so that I can repaint it in a way that they feel is an accurate representation of them. And one of the things that's really helped me and that I teach now in, in some of my speaking gigs, there's a framework called Ford, which you guys probably, if you haven't even heard of it, you've probably practiced it through your own conversations, but it stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of like, do you have siblings? Are, do you still have both of your parents? What was your education like? What were you like in high school or college? What has your work life looked like? What do you like to do when you're not at work? Where do you want to go in the future? So it's a lot of questions within those categories because I found that's a really nice kind of clean way to get to know people. But the the conversations themselves and the topics, it spans everything. I talked with a dude about scuba diving for 45 minutes. Hmm. And I've talked to people about really dark, sad times of their lives. It, it just kind of spans the board. And I myself do not try to guide it in any one direction. I just kind of like to sit back and let it go where it goes. And I think that is actually a big reason why people feel comfortable coming to me and being part of the project. Yeah, no, totally. And for anyone who wants to follow along and kind of see the page while we have this conversation on Instagram, it's Rob's 10 K friends. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. Like the first one that I clicked in you picture of a stranger. Uh, and then it looks like you do a quote, of something they've said and then kind of in your own words begin to tell their story like this one starts out uh i don't want to know everything but i want to know enough to be dangerous quote dave anderson reads 104 books per year because he has an insatiable thirst for knowledge like and then it goes on and on but uh even that alone just really engaging piece and kind of quote to pull out and you know every post is similar different picture with you and a person and then kind of their quote their story uh, and some of them have video I believe you take as well yeah so once the pandemic started and I switched to zoom I started asking people if they were okay with me recording it just so I could grab a 60 minute clip to add more of their personality to the post mm -hmm. and that's been really cool uh, and I, I don't do it for the in-person ones because it feels awkward for me. Zoom is it's so in the background, you know, like if we're recording the whole conversation, they're not really thinking about what they're saying the whole time. But if I have someone in person and I whip out my phone and say, okay, I'm going to record this to post to my page. Then, yeah. As you guys know, people change when they, they know they're being recorded. But yeah, so the ones in person don't have video that though, that is something I'd like to go into in the future is finding a way to have that in the background in person as well just not there yet but yeah the virtual ones all have videos attached to them and where would you meet these people are they all from like a, a like where you are or have you had to do a decent bit of traveling to meet some of these people i started the project in philadelphia i was living in the northern liberties neighborhood of philly and i was there from june of 2015 to june of 2017 so i started the project november of 2015 and then actually eight months later the company that i worked for was bought out so i was laid off and I jumped into this full time. So I've been meeting people full time since July of 2016. And when my lease was up, my roommate from Penn State moved out to California after school and lived in LA and said, hey, if you wanna come out here and stay with me, I have an extra bedroom. You don't have to pay rent, you can just crash with me. So 2017, that summer I lived with him. Then I came back home to my parents for five months. I lived in LA for nine months in 2018. And then I came back and then I went back to LA for three months in 2019. 
Then I came back for two months and I went up to Hoboken for nine months to stay with another friend from Penn State and his wife. So in person, it's been basically Philly, LA, New York City slash Hoboken. And to go out to LA and back every time I would drive there. So I've driven across the wow. country six different times, Jesus. five of them by myself. Yeah, which was an experience. Like I would end up in Salt Lake City and stay with someone who reached out from Instagram and I would wow. meet them for the hour. And then I'd be like, all right, sorry, I got to go to bed because I have to wake up at 6 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> and then I would drive to the next place and I would meet someone in that city and then go to bed and whatever. And I've also had people fly me to Seattle, Orlando, and Toronto, which has been really cool. So I've met so people. They'll fly you out just to be a part of this experiment? That has happened, yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And it's cool. You said I've been I've been meeting people full time since 2016. It's it's so cool that you've turned this into literally a job, which is awesome. And it's cool that that was kind of your intent from the beginning, because I'm sure that kind of changes the way that you approach things logistically. Like, I don't want this to just be an Instagram page, a side hustle. I want to, to do this for a living, which you've been able to sustain, which is incredible. And how many people have you met out of the 10,000 so far? The woman I just met was number 4,596. Uh, 4,596. Okay. I should hit the halfway point probably next spring or summer. Wow. Do you have a deadline? I don't have a deadline. If you look back at those initial emails that I was sending out to people being like, hey, do you want to be one of the first 10? In it, I say, I'm going to do this in aggressively about four years. Next month will be six years since I started, and I'm less than halfway there. So wow. I clearly missed the mark on how long it's going <laughs> to take. But I, I'm 30 now, so I think to finish by the time I'm 40 would be cool just because it sounds clean. But I, when I first took it full time, I was meeting five people a day. And then when I first went out to L.A., I dropped down to four because of the traffic and whatnot. And I kind of kept that pace for a while until this summer when I started putting more time into growing as a public speaker because that's kind of become the financial fuel to allow me to continue doing this. Uh, so I'm, I'm moving at a slower pace, but at the same time, having more money to actually do the project. So it all kind of works together. But yeah, I think it might take like 10 more years. But if it takes eight, I'm cool with that. If it takes 15, I'm cool with that. I actually love meeting people and doing what I'm doing. So to me, it's more about the journey than the destination as cliche as that is, but I do enjoy it. So it's fun for me. Yeah. It also sounds like, you know, I was going to ask the question. I mean, once you hit 10,000, is it something that you think you can just walk away from? I mean, if, if, if you're doing it for 15 years, it kind of becomes like a part of you in a way, you know? Yeah. Have you ever seen, um, free solo with Alex? Yes. Tom? Oh, yeah. So I remember when he gets to the top and he actually completes the goal and like you feel like someone would be so pumped up when they just climbed a mountain with no ropes and he gets up and he's like, all right, cool. That was sweet. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> that's going to be me when I complete this project because it's not something that I'm looking forward to being finished with. Um, I'll, I'll be proud when I hit that number. But yeah, I might continue meeting people with without a defined goal at that point you know, and just kind of like mm -hmm. make it a part of my regular life. I think intentional human connection is something that a lot of people miss out on, a ton of value that people miss out on. Uh, you guys get to do it through your, your podcast. I get to do it through my project. So I want to continue it. But right now, I see myself like married with a wife and kids, having the time to dedicate to them and then being a professor at a university, hmm. teaching a course where students pair off one on one every class period and learn from each other's backgrounds as opposed to a textbook or a PowerPoint slide. Because I want them to have, like my perspective has increased so much since I've set out on this mission. And I want other people to have that in their lives. And also I want people who are socially anxious or whatnot to have a safe space in their universities where it's like built in connections because I was really extroverted. I kind of hit the ground running at Penn State, made a lot of great friends and had an awesome time there but there were also people who transferred because they feel like they don't find their home of friends so if it's built in i feel like people could foster those connections throughout mm. their four years and then my hope is that down the road there'd be people like 20 years after college being like how did you meet oh i had this class with this professor rob lawless and blah 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 
That's so cool, yeah. man. That yeah, that's such a cool vision. It's so important, and it's. I I I always use this example, and you know, Joe and I talk about this sometimes on the show, sometimes off the show, and I'm sure this is similar for you. To become a better listener and to see the progress that you make as a listener is so rewarding because it's 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 hard. It's a skill to harness and. You know, lesson one in that class <laughs> should just be, hey, when a person says their name and meets you, like actually try to remember their name. Good luck with that. You know, I know we all have trouble where it's like, oh, I just met someone at a party and I'm already thinking what I'm going to say back to them. And I, I don't even remember their name. And it really is, you know, such a, a skill to hone um, to just be open, accepting of other people, to, to learn to listen as much to tell your story. Um, that's cool. It's a, it's a really powerful vision. And I could really picture that not just working, but uh, I could picture every university wanting to, to have a class like that. Yeah, that's the, my, my goal is to prove, prove that it's valuable at one university and then be able to like show other professors how to do it at their own universities. So across the country or world, let's say there's this kind of blanket system that everyone goes through to have this perspective and empathy before they go on and become citizens of society or whatever. But yeah, and it's funny you talk about listening. I've, I feel like I've become a much greater listener through my project. And the one thing that really helped me was the fact that I was writing these people's stories from memory afterwards. Mm. Like if I wasn't listening to them, it was like trying to take a test without ever looking at the notebook or the, the textbook before. Mm. But if I listened, I had all this information to work with that I could piece together in whatever way I wanted. And I became a very visual listener where I would literally watch people's stories in my mind. And I still do that when I talk to them. And it's, it's helped me be a much more present person as well. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also curious when you, when you do these, um, talks, uh, what is the like main talking point? Is it, is you just sharing your experience about this project or is there something like an underlying thing, kind of like what you're talking about now, like the, the vision of this end goal of having like a class and being a professor like what do you usually like what is the main topic of you know these talks are you talking about the speaking gigs yes <clears throat> yeah I, I usually introduce my story and kind of walk people through my background and then i walk them through that forward framework as a way of hey here if you are trying to get to know your classmate and you're someone who feels anxious and you feel like if you go into a, a conversation that it's going to drop and it's going to feel awkward and then you start worrying about what you're going to say, here's a framework that you can use. Just think about their family, think about their occupation, their recreation and their dreams. And the way I structure it is I introduce questions for the family category and then I break people out into one on one pairs for like five, 10 minutes and they discuss with each other. And then we go through occupation questions and topics and then break them out and they discuss. So at the end, people have this framework that they can use going forward. Mm -hmm. And they've also met four of their classmates, four of their colleagues throughout the seminar, the presentation, whatever. So that's what I've been doing for people. And with universities, it's like a student orientation kind of thing. And with corporations, it's been diversity, equity, and inclusion because at the heart of it, uh, of DEI is empathy and a willingness to understand someone's story, even though it might be different from yours. And so it's like, how do, how do you get to know someone's story in a respectful way? And you can use this framework to do that. Hmm. Yeah, that's super valuable. And, you know, I'm curious with your journey, it's awesome to hear how far this has progressed and now to the point where these speaking engagements are essentially courses almost. Uh, but do you remember the first person that you met, like the first interaction that blew you away and confirmed in your mind that, okay, I made the right choice by doing this project. You know, it was, I was smart to pursue this and I truly feel like I'm onto something. Do you remember that person or conversation that did that for you? I can say thinking about someone whose story blew me away just in terms of making me realize how much perspective I would gain out of this project. It was the 1300th person. And he was introduced to me through someone in the Philly Instagram photography community. His name was Chris and he was a hotel concierge. And I remember walking up to him thinking he probably grew up in the suburbs like me. They probably went to school around here. 
but when he spoke, he had an accent, and I learned he was half German, half South African, and he was raised in Nigeria in the early years of his life, and when he was 16, he was living in Romania. And that year, he went over to New York City to go boating on the Hudson River with some friends. He ended up falling off of the boat, was run over by it, had his legs sucked up into the engines, <clears throat> and was given a 12% chance of ever walking again and a 15% chance of living. He lost like five or six liters of blood, technically died on the way to the hospital. And this dude was telling me this story as we were walking around the streets of Philly. And I was like, I literally thought this dude was just a guy who went to college in this area and got a job as a hotel concierge who liked taking photos on the side. And there was so much to his story than I ever, so much more to his story than I ever could have imagined. It felt like a punch in the gut. And that's not the only time that I've felt that when talking to people. So I just, his story helped me frame life in such an incredible way because for me doing this project, you know, doing it full time since July of 2016, there's a ton of cycles of confidence and doubt. Sometimes being like, oh, this is going to be great. So many people are going to love this. And then other times being like, oh, I don't think people really care about the work that I'm doing. No one wants to pay attention to this and whatever. But in all of the struggles times, I can think back to someone like Chris and say, I, I didn't get my legs sucked up into the engines of a boat and sliced up by the engines, you know, that life is, is not that bad right now. I can continue going. And he was the first kind of story that struck me like that. And I've had several, several others since then that I've kind of built on that notion. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so funny, like listening to the way that you're speaking about this project is how me and Greg kind of talk about, you know, this podcast also just like talking to people um, sometimes anonymously and just hearing their stories. And it, it does give you a lot of perspective. And I do recommend it to anybody to like, uh, you know, we obviously agree with your mission and, and what you're talking about. Like, I think it is very important to get to know people and, and people that you don't really know or that are different than you. Um, and and it, it helps for them being like complete strangers because you obviously you see a person, they start talking based upon their accent, the way they look, the way they dress, you already have these judgments about them subconsciously, but sometimes they all just fade away and then you get a reality check of like, oh man, I was completely wrong. Like it, it makes you more empathetic. It makes you, you know, less judgmental. It's just a, a good way to kind of, uh, you know, just work on yourself. You know what I mean? So I, I think it's really awesome, you know, this, this mission to meet 10,000 people. Originally I was like, 10,000 people, is that even a lot? You know, like in my mind, I was like, it's 10,000, a lot of people, like, cause you meet a lot of people, you walk around and whatever, but it's a ton. Like, like you're saying it's so many people. So to go out of your way, meet 10,000 strangers, I can only imagine what that does for a person. Like when you reach 10,000, like you've heard 10,000 stories from 10,000 different people. Like it, it must be so fulfilling to, to even be close to halfway there. Like at this point, like already worth it. And you're not even halfway there. Like that's, that's wild to think about. Yeah, I think about how much I feel like I've grown as a person since starting the project in terms of like feeling a greater sense of belonging to the world and like the, the community and uh, how much my perspective has changed, how much more I have to be grateful for. For example, like I have, I have two parents, my mom and dad are still together. I'm the youngest of three. I have an older brother and an older sister who are both doing well. And I'm just very conscious of the fact that I should actively appreciate the, my time with them. I've met college students who are <clears throat> only children who've lost both of their parents already because they've both passed away. Mm -hmm. So imagine being a college student and your immediate family is already taken from you. Like, I, I feel like so many of us just assume our family members are going to be with us for the rest of our lives. And I talk to people all the time who've lost a parent or lost a sibling or a friend. and. It's, uh, it's striking. It, it makes you think about it. But yeah, I feel like I've grown so much. And then the 10,000, I think sometimes, because if someone sees my project through a TikTok that I put out back in January, to them, I just started this project, right? And they're like, oh, you just started meeting people last year or whatever. So people oftentimes say things like, oh, did you just start a couple years ago? Or you started with the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I've been at this for literally six years every day consistently meeting people and 10,000 hours is a lot of time when you sit down and, and think about it, but it's been awesome. Yeah. I mean, to, 
to your point too of just the perspective that you gain it's just just gratitude in general for even this podcast that we do that was probably one of the biggest unexpected takeaways because you mentioned it before it's it gives you this different perspective to look back at when times are tough for you or when you think times are tough for you but then realize this really isn't a struggle in the grand scheme of struggles and you know for us to look back at so many of the conversations of uh, you know people who have yeah lost loved ones been in just such unfortunate terrifying situations things that you know they they now have to navigate the rest of their lives after such loss or such trauma and it really gives you that perspective and gives you that gratitude and it's it, it almost makes you feel like you're it's disrespectful if you don't become more present you know and if you don't become grateful for the things that you have uh, and it's it's just cool to you know kind of share that perspective and and hear that you're on that same wavelength and uh but with that said you know one question i have is like i love projects like this for the obvious reasons of everything that we just talked about like destigmatizing, you know, having conversations with strangers, creating a platform to prove that, you know, all people are interesting. You can't judge people uh, that you don't know. But I love how much of a lesson in just grit and determination this is. You kind of go out of your way to put this weight on your own shoulders, where you start something that you almost have to finish now. You, you've put it out into the universe. You've said 10,000 people. And consistency is really the only driving force to get you to that finish line and was that part of it for you to kind of test your own work ethic and resilience because this it's not easy work to do what you're doing i think it was i think i trusted that i had the resilience to do it um but i didn't anticipate how much it would require and how because i started it when i was 24 and i think one of the things that i think a lot about now is when you're 24 you and your college friends are on pretty much a similar pain. You know, like you just graduated from school, you're all starting your jobs, you're still in that entry level of the real world. And then as you get older, like I, I started to realize that because I chose this path, that my path would fork from that of my friends. They all had the nine to five stable jobs and were able to buy their houses and get married and, and have dogs and things like that. And now they're all working towards kids, which is awesome. And they've never made me feel less than for choosing a different path. But it has been a little bit isolating going into that area by yourself because you're like, oh, I'm out here in the woods trying to figure this out of how to make this work. And it does require a lot of showing up every day. And it is something I'm happy to do, but uh, there are days when I'm tired and I, I feel like I have, I have to show up and, and be present for people. Um, and it requires a lot of faith of even when my bank account would drop and drop and drop being like, no, I'm still going down the right path. Like eventually it's going to swing back up without really seeing any, anything that's going to like any hand reaching out to be like, Oh, don't worry. I got you. It's like, you're jumping off of a cliff and you're trying to build an airplane on the way down that will bring you back up before you hit the bottom. And sometimes it feels like you're going to hit that bottom, but I've been fortunate that I've always had like another part of the airplane come together. That's given me a little lift. And now I feel like with the speaking stuff that I'm actually starting to pick up and instead of me thinking so much about the struggle, it's like my mind is more so thinking about the opportunity now, which is really cool. Hmm. Have you ever met anyone that you didn't like? I have met people that I don't think I would spend another hour with, but I guess my approach to it is, so here's the thing, I, I think people should treat human connection as an experience rather than a transaction. So I don't really think about whether or not I like the people. Like if I do, that's cool. If I don't, that's fine too. Either way, I'm learning from them because if, if it's a personality that I don't jive with, I'm learning how I can interact with them because if they exist, there's someone else out there who exists just like them that has that similar type of personality. So I look at it all as a, a learning experience and even if my like there's never been someone that I've wanted to leave the hour from because even if our personalities don't match we're both coming together with this understanding that we're going to respect each other's stories and spend that time together and I think that's one of the coolest things that I've learned from the project too is I've met with people who are so different from me but because I was willing to listen to them 
they treated me with so much respect. And I think there'd be more of that in the world if people were willing to respect each other. I hate confrontation, so I'm happy to listen to people and, and hear them out. But yeah, that's kind of the way that I see it is if I don't like them, it's it's not, it, it me, doesn't make it more or less of a, a value in that meeting. But there have been people that I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would continue hanging out with them just because we don't get along. Right. Right. What, what about on the flip side and not in a salacious way, but have you ever met anyone that you maybe felt an attraction to or after spending sort of an intimate hour getting to know them, you know, wanting to get to know them better? Or do you just not even entertain thoughts like this with this project? I'm pretty passive about it. Um, so there, there's a few girls that I've gone out with after the fact, which is cool. And like one of them, we just kind of continued talking after we met and then met up and like went out in the city and whatnot. Um, one girl I met on a Monday morning and we enjoyed that meeting and got together for a date that night. Um, and yeah, I think like I, a lot of people say, you're gonna meet your wife through this project, which I'm down for. I think that'd be a cool mm. storyline. <laughs> That would be. Yeah, but I'm passive about it because I think it would ruin things if, if, if I led into the experience. Like if I met a girl and then afterwards was like, hey, so that was cool. Like, why don't we get together? Because I feel like that would for her be another experience of like, I thought I could go into just a platonic time with a guy and he's mm -hmm. flipped it on me again. And I don't want to be that person. But if I'm attracted to a girl and then she reaches back out to me, then I'm open to it. Nice. Seems very That's... fair. Very fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. This is really cool. Like I, when I first heard about it, like, you know, uh, you know, we, I was so like, this is such, this is like right up our alley. Like I, I love this idea of just, you know, kind of meeting people and, you know, just kind of sitting down and having an hour long conversation with them. Like it's really cool. And it, I mean, I have kind of two questions here is like, you know, you say you're doing an hour, has it ever like exceeded that? Or do you do a hard stop? Like we have an hour, we're done. Or does it ever kind of spill over? Like you spent like two and a half hours with somebody. I have had times where it has spilled over, but only if I've had the time to allow it to spill over. So one of the things with, and I guess that's something that I've had to figure out as well is I don't want it to seem systematic to people, but at the same time, I do have to be systematic about it. So I would meet people so LA, for example, I'd meet people at noon, two, four, and six. And that would mean I'd meet them in different coffee shops. And so I'd meet with them for an hour and then I had an hour to the next meeting. In that time, I had to drive, park my car in a place that I wouldn't get a ticket in, write their story, post it to Instagram and show up for the next meeting. So if my noon meeting went to 1.30, then it's just the domino effect of then I show up late for the 2 p.m. and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had to keep it in a, in a kind of a systematic way and that there have been people who have recreated my project in their their own ways which i think is awesome a couple of guys from toronto did it there's a kid in india doing it right now and both both of them have reached out to me being like how do you deal with the time and i because they'll go into 90 minutes or they'll go into three three hours and i find for me one of the ways that i've been able to get this far with it is creating a routine and creating predictability around it so in a sense, I, I do limit it to the hour, but I don't, it's not like I have an alarm set and then it goes off and then I say, okay, we're time's up, we're done, I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. I just kind of, when, when that last topic fizzles out, then I'll make sure to be like, okay, I just have to check the time, I have to run, which sometimes I'll ask a question at 10.57 and then they go on for 15 minutes and give you a monologue and you're like, oh no, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but this is cool because the other layer to this whole conversation, if there's anyone out there listening that is a creator or wants to get into the space with any project of their own, it's super insightful uh, to, to just hear the logistics behind it and how you set it up. And, you know, it's so true. And even for us, we realized early on, you know, for this to work, to, to talk to so many different types of people, the structure is everything. If we, if we kind of break the structure and the routine, it's just going to become too much. Like we have to kind of package this the same way to let the unique stories breathe if if that makes sense and and be able to deliver them to people uh, i just think that's you know insightful for anyone you know with a sort of similar interest uh to create like these it's just cool to see the the process that you've worked on 
have adjusted over time, you know, to, to make this work, because I think a lot of people can passively look at something like this or a podcast or anything and say, well, that's easy or that's not a real job or, you know, how hard can that be? Uh, it's really hard and it's really time consuming. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of behind the scenes work to make it look effortless in a sense. Uh, so I just think it's, it's important to get that out there too and, and super helpful for people. A hundred percent. It reminds me of going to the gym. I feel like if you walk into the gym on like a Monday and then a Tuesday and a Thursday and you're like, oh, I'm feeling arms and back today. And then I can't remember what I did on Tuesday. So let me just do triceps as well. You're not going to see that progress. But if you're like, I'm going three days a week, I'm following this specific workout routine with these pre-programmed activities, then you're going to see that progress. And it's like you can turn your mind off to that, the uncertainty of it and just follow the steps. And I Mm -hmm. think that's what leads to a lot of success right um with out of all these guests i mean you spend an hour with these people and you know you sometimes you said that you have like pretty deep uh intimate conversations um do you to this day like keep in touch with a good amount of them or is it usually like you spend the hour and then you don't really hear from them again there's like a bell curve of it there's a lot of people that i haven't seen or talked to since And then there's people that I've become good friends with. And then there's people who, if I post something on Instagram, like the fact that I was, like Univision did a story on me yesterday and I shared it to my stories and people were congratulating me and things like that. So I have those types of interactions with people. Mm -hmm. And then there are people like, have you ever heard of No More Lonely Friends? No. Uh. So it's probably up your alley as well. There's this girl, Marissa Mize, who went viral on TikTok because She's in New York City. Um, her friends like made plans specifically on the day that she couldn't attend them. And some dude overheard it. And he made a TikTok and he's like, I don't know who Marissa is, but I want to let you know your friends are planning the birthday party for the day you're not going to be here. And TikTok did its thing. And the video made its way to Marissa. And she took that experience and ran with it and created this community called No More Lonely Friends, where she hosts meetups in different cities across the country for people to come meet each other and Mm. and not feel lonely. And she's been covered by like the New York Times. She was just on Drew Barrymore's show. And I reconnected with her because she was going to have an event in Philly this past weekend. And I was going to attend it, but my brother was in town. But it just she's now in this kind of community human connection space as well. And I've been talking to her about like, hey, you should get into public speaking. And even though she and I met in Los Angeles back in like 2017 or 2018, haven't seen or talked to each other since we've now like reconnected and popped back into each other's life. So a, a good comparison, I guess, is someone that you haven't seen since middle school or high school. And then you run into them again and you know they're not a stranger to you. You haven't seen them in a while, but you know you have that foundation with each other. That's kind mm. of what the experience is like for me. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking as you say this and no pressure, just, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure because you're on our show talking to us. But <laughs> uh, and, and we know you still have a lot of slots open. I would love to have an hour conversation with you outside of this and be part of the project. And I'm sure Joe would, too. Not together, separately. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you would want, I'd be down and I think that'd be cool. And it's like, I, you know, so much of the show isn't about us and we try to leave ourselves and story kind of out of it just to be there for the guest. Uh, but you know, if there was anyone that was going to talk to us and give us something that we can then share with our listeners about us, uh, you seem like a perfect fit. So we can talk after. Yeah, I would love that. And I, I will be in your guys area next week so we can chat about it whether it's in person or or virtual but i would love to have you guys be part of it look at this strangers (laughs) becoming friends (laughs) (laughs) oh man um cool and also you know i I guess you know the 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 biggest thing i guess i mean i and i guess we like kind of covered it already um but your what would you say your biggest takeaway from this or like biggest surprise is like something that we haven't covered yet is there like an overarching theme that you've sort of like learned throughout this process that you didn't necessarily expect that you think is probably the most important part of this whole experience yes i say this all the time and i feel like it always hits home with people and i feel like they find comfort in it but so i've talked to people who 
are very successful in what they do. I've talked to people who have like millions of followers and whatnot and people who are struggling and people like on all different ends of the spectrum of life paths and consistently it doesn't matter if they're successful or not, if they're 50 years old or 15 years old. The one thing that I've taken away is no one really knows what they're doing with their lives. Everyone's just doing the best they can with the resources that they have. And I think a lot of people walk around thinking everyone but me has their life together when in reality it's no one including you has their life together. So I've stopped trying to like have all the answers figured out and just be like a perfect person for my life. And I, I see myself as a work in progress and I see everyone else as a work in progress because that's what I'm hearing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah, no one really knows what they're doing with their life. I think that's the, the biggest thing that I've taken away. I love yeah. that because I mean, that's even like helpful for, for me, like I always kind of feel that way too. Of like, you know, I, up until this point in my life, I had some sort of success, but I also, oh, like, I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do in five years. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know exactly what's going on. But yeah, in you know, you're right. Like, I, I, through the people that I've, you know, have talked to or or whatever that have confided in me, it, 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 I think I have a similar experience where people, no matter what level they are, they're kind of like still trying to figure something out and. You know, you never really have the answer. And uh, I think that's like the beauty of it also. You know, all these things are happening around us. Everyone has a different story. Um, and, and those thoughts of just being like, oh, I don't have my life figured out. Everyone else is. And especially with social media, it's, it's very easy to fall into that trap of thinking that everyone has their entire lives like put together. Um, but yeah, it's just not the case. You know, in my experience and from you, I mean, you've talked to way more people than I have and you know you getting that same sort of thing so it's validating to even hear you say that yeah, yeah. absolutely and I, I think that's been a gift of the project i tell people all the time i'm rooted in reality the only people i follow on instagram are the people that i've met through my project hmm. so despite what i'm seeing on their feeds it comes after i've established this in-person candid relationship with them so i'm rooted in the reality of who they are despite hmm. what i see on their accounts that's a great perspective too and yeah to that point i mean that is the trap of social media and that's the most damaging part is we compare ourselves to others and that can have some serious lasting effects and you know just in general for you to use social media but to create this space where people can go and say okay here's someone else struggling here's someone else's story here's people like me uh, or people not like me but just to see what people are going through um, it's just always good when you can find at least some positive nuggets on social media that are, you know, as, as close to the reality of a person's life as possible. So really awesome. Uh, we thank you so much for, you know, taking the time. Just really enjoyable conversation. I know, you know, for, for myself, for Joe, uh, just because of the similarities of what we do, it, it's just very cool to, you know, chat with someone else who is getting a uh, similar experience in a way but yeah we love this project you know we fully support this uh and we're excited to get you know your story and and this story out there to everyone yeah thank you i appreciate you guys giving me a platform to tell my side of things my story because i yeah as you guys do i'm often doing that for other people so i always appreciate when people do it for me and the relatability is huge i i love chatting with people and i found through my project along the way you just get bubbled up to other people who are doing similar things. It's mm -hmm. kind of like nature takes its course and puts you there. And I'm happy that I was introduced to you guys through Kate, one of my followers who recommended I reach out to you. So thank you, Kate. And thank you to you guys for having me on. Awesome. And shout, yeah, shout out to Kate. That's uh, spreading the word of things like this, bringing people together. That's, that's what it's all about. And that's in essence, what the point of building a community is to, make it inclusive to bring other people in to share interests. So really awesome to see when that happens. Cool. cool. Well, uh, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Do you want to, you know, plug any of your social media or your website or anything? Oh, uh, sure. So my social media, you guys mentioned it, it's Rob's 10 K friends on Instagram. That's where I post a picture and the story of everyone that I've met. I'm also on TikTok at Rob's 10 K friends there. I kind of post tips and a little bit more behind the scenes stuff. But those are the, the main two channels for now. I have a website, which is robs10kfriends.com. And I'm building a speaking website right now called roblawless.com. Not a porn website. It's a speaking <laughs> website. <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, Por- the porn will happen after you meet 10,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Thank you, man, so much for, uh, for taking the time and, and talking with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, guys. Talk soon. Yeah, have a good one. Bye. Before we get to our final thoughts, we do have a sponsor for today's show, uh, which is Broom. Broom is amazing because it kind of helps solve a problem that we all kind of have dealt with at some point in our lives or will deal with at some point in our lives. And that is going to a car dealership and sort of dealing with, you know, all of the stuff that goes on there. You know, the price is not really the price and you don't really know what's going on. You got to go to a million different ones. You don't get a good price at one. You go to a different one. Now with Vroom, uh, you can just buy and sell cars online, have them delivered or picked up. So you never have to go to a dealership ever again, uh, which is extremely efficient. You know, you could just go on to Vroom, uh, and uh, search thousands of cars and you get the price right there. You know what it is. You're not going to like have some weird add on the last second while you're about to sign. They're like, oh, yeah, you got to add this on. Like, you know what you're paying for um, and that's all you need. Uh, you don't have to deal with a pushy salesman, um, anyone who's pressuring you into taking a bad deal. Like the last time I, I wish I would have had this is the last time I went and got a car because it's so helpful to just have a price know the car you're getting and everything about it and not have to deal with this like wishy-washy way of selling something. Um, So yeah, go check out Vroom. It's it's great. Uh, When you shop on Vroom.com, you never have to haggle or negotiate, like I said. Um, When you sell your car on Vroom, you get a price instantly, so you don't have to waste time at a dealership anymore as well. Um, So it's all very instant. It saves you a lot of time. It saves you a lot of travel, you know, so you don't have to drive to a bunch of different dealerships. Or around here, they're kind of spread out. So... Even that is saving you time as well. Uh, extremely efficient. Love the product. Um, go check out uh, Vroom.com. Uh, you know, so the next time you're shopping for a car or you want to sell a car, go to Vroom.com, log on. You can see thousands of cars and go get your car that way and have it delivered. Just a cool guy, you know, just a cool dude. I feel like we just added a third member to this crew. <laughs> That's what it feels like. I feel like I've known him for a long time. I love the concept a lot, man, because, and I've been on record saying this so many times, and it always confuses people, but one of my dream jobs was to be a bartender for this reason. Not in a busy place, but in a place where there's regulars and you could sit down and like talk to people and get to know them. I feel like that's so important, and it's like probably one of the most satisfying things in the world. And I love the way that he described it in the beginning, where he said, you know, he was on campus and he would always see someone that he knows. So imagine going out of your way to meet everyone so that you could walk around and get to the point where you meet 10,000 people. You could walk around and probably run into a bunch of people, depending on where you are, you know what I mean, that you would know. And it kind of makes the world feel like that. Like you all go to the same school, you know? Yeah, like how yeah. cool is that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just it's an invisible connection of sorts. And it's just you know we know from the show and it's you know even more powerful when it happens in person just the spark that you get just what it does to you to meet someone either unexpectedly or a stranger and and connect with someone powerfully that just wasn't in your life prior it's just one of the coolest feelings on earth you know and and he's he's making a career out of that and it's awesome and it's it's simple like i love when simplicity can be so impactful you know he just keep it simple meet people Ten thousand people that's the framework go and we'll see what happens there's two big things that i take away from this in the way that i sort of interpret like the importance of this one is that spending time an hour with people that you don't know naturally you're going to run in people that are very different than you they don't think the same way that you do they you know wherever they stand it's just important to listen to people though Mm. you know and like Obviously, like now, especially, it feels like the world is so divided and and people are just like angry with each other for God knows what reason. And no one's listening. Like everyone's just screaming at each other. So it's it's really like refreshing to see something like this. And, And we know this because we do this show. You only get empathy and understanding and like you're just a better person and the world will be better if you if you listen like a lot of people just want to be heard with social media it's like we're all just screaming right and and we're posting and it's all about us and that's what like has been like the the 
like the, what's normal now is just to scream as loud as you can, get as many people to hear you, but no one's listening to each other. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like dividing people. And then when you have projects like this and podcasts like this, it sort of flips it on its head. And this is how you become empathetic and, and how you, you know, people, you're likable. Like people, like you, no one's, you have to listen to people to be able to learn something. You can't just scream all of the things that you know and think the world has to think the way that you do. Like you have to have some sort of understanding after a while, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, like the other thing also, um, and I, I tell people this all the time, in this day and age where we have access to, you know, technology and these crazy resources, pick a thing that you really enjoy. Literally anything can be turned into a business or something you do for the rest of your life. And it's, it's very satisfying to have those things. And down to this, the guy's just like, I just want to meet people. I want to meet 10,000 people. And now he's talking to people. People are writing articles about him. People are having them on their podcasts. And he's meeting these people and he's just doing it. And it's just consistency. And it's just a decision that you make of being like, this is the thing I'm going to do. It doesn't even matter what it is. And like, you can turn it into something. Like, though, it's, it's, this dude is so validating to talk to. And it's so interesting. And I just think that it's like a perfect fucking project right up my fucking alley to be honest like i i love it i think it's amazing for sure yeah no man there's like that uh, that second part of it that just everything he's saying is just giving the framework for you can do it and it's it's just consistency it's just taking your idea proving the concept and just running with it and not getting too high not getting too low just going for it and and expecting nothing out of it too just to mm-hmm. do it and be like, I just want to do this and see what happens. And then along the way, you say, oh, I could turn this into something. Yeah. And then doing that, like, it's, it's awesome. I love yeah, it. that's kind of when the rewards reveal themselves, I guess. And uh, yeah, I mean, to your point before, it's when you, even when you take politics out of it, the scariest thing with a growing divide is that it's going to be implanted in people's minds that there's other people, other humans that are so different from them that they could never possibly get along and that's when people stop attempting they stop wanting to hear other perspectives or they stop wanting to meet strangers or they just assume and they assume so much that the divide again not even just politically but that will just spark people just believing that people are so different from them when it's just not true and i don't know how many times we have to have conversations like this or meet strangers and realize oh, wow, that person who I assumed was different or that I judged is just like me or they're going through the same problems or they have the same interests. It's just such an important reminder. Like as many times as we can get those type of stories out, it's kind of the only way to heal, I think. So love what he's doing. Love that there's other projects similar and I hope more people do stuff like this. Doesn't, it should, it should never end to be honest. More listening, less screaming about yourself. Okay. (laughs) I think that everyone could, could do that. Less screaming and fucking trying to get all the attention on yourself for no reason, by the way. We don't even know what we're doing. We're literally just going through the motions and, and destroying these, like, like you said, the divide. And, and it's, uh, it's just, it's terrible, dude. We need to change. Yeah. <laughs> we need to change. And this is, this is a way to do it, man. I hope this dude inspires you the way that, you know, he's kind of just validated and also inspired me in a way of, of like, okay, this is, this is correct, I think. Like, this is the way that we were supposed to, like, this is how you build a society and with understanding and, like, love and, like, you know, empathy. But there's none of that anymore because people have their opinions. You have to, you know, and it's just, it's crazy. It's it's just, cra- it's craziness out there, yeah. people. More well, listening. But again, that's, that's what we're fed. That's what we see. That's where the drama is. But let's, let's end on a positive note. Like, hey, we've got this show. <laughs> We've got his Instagram. We've got the other people he mentioned. We need to also go out of our way to curate a better experience for ourselves. Like we can find these projects. We can find these people. We can remind ourselves it's not all ugly. It's not all bad. It's out there. It just takes a little extra work to find it these days. But, you know, really. Well said. Thank you. But overall. Well said positive positive stuff great guy uh awesome love it love the thing uh and i'm saying yeah i'm trying to get on this so i know clearly you try to sneak in what sneak sneak in there you're like yo by the way let me get on the fucking thing dude I, yeah it I will just, be cool i like that he only follows the people that he had the experience with so when he does reach ten thousand, it's going to become a thing and then you're gonna be like oh, mm, one of the ten thousand. Mm-hmm. 
I'm just trying to get a follow out here, you know. So. Just trying to get your followers <laughs> up. Feel you. That's it. If you want 10,000 followers, that's the way to do it. Me 10,000 people, bro, yeah. they'll follow you probably. <laughs> Unless that hour goes terribly. But, you know, uh, we appreciate, uh, you know, Rob coming on and talking to us. But uh, for anyone out there that wants to be a guest on the show, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Go to OPLshow.com. Uh, or just send us an email directly, oplpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, follow us on Instagram at oplpodcast. If you want to join our Patreon, head over to patreon.com slash show for bonus episodes and to be part of that community. And use code OPL for 15% off your copy of Pay the Price if you haven't. Uh, this game sort of our attempt to also bring people together, you know, bring game night back after the pandemic, create some crazy <laughs> memories in person with people. So it's a good marketing tactic, right? But just fucking, that's how you bring it full circle, folks. (laughs) That's a professional there. All right. That is all. We'll see you guys next time.